Welcome to yet another Hump Day Coffee Break. And today we're going to be talking about what to ask in online donor surveys. Now, if this is your first time attending a Hump Day Coffee Break, this is the format. Basically, 15-minute presentation. Uh, get your coffee, get your tea, take notes, and then that's going to be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. So today I'm really, really happy to present Rachel Muir. She's an awesome person. She's a mom. She founded her own nonprofit called Girl Start. She's a VP of training at Pursuant. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. This is such a great topic and everybody on the call today, you're going to get lots of great insights. I'm going to start off by talking about why do a survey in the first place and all the fantastic benefits that you can get out of doing a survey of your constituents. I'm going to share a really fantastic visual example for you. It's really simple, it's really clean, and every question that these folks answered is super strategic. Then I'm going to talk with you guys about the things that I do not want you to ask on a donor survey because those are extremely important. And um, I'm going to give you a really great bonus tip that I learned from uh, Adrian Sargent at AFP uh, International this year. And then we'll open it up to some Q&A. So I'm going to start with talking to you guys about why to do a donor survey. So the first reason is it's really, really easy to do a donor survey. So that's the good news. Uh, the second thing is, if you do these right, it makes your donors love you more. And that's what we want. We, it makes our donors feel like we really care about them. It makes them feel like they're in our inner circle. And that's really important. You know, if you think about what someone gets, what a donor gets out of giving you money, it's really just emotional satisfaction. It's a very intangible thing. It's just emotional satisfaction. So. A donor survey is a really important tool to help you be able to more successfully deliver that emotional satisfaction to your donors. It keeps them loyal and this, this could be like reason number one because we all know how terrible donor attrition is in our sector and how much this cost us. I mean, you know, I've seen three out of four first time donors won't give a second gift. I've seen four out of five. It certainly varies by sector. We see a little bit more loyalty with higher ed and certain other verticals. But the bottom line is that all of us are losing a lot of our donors who don't go on to make a second gift. And the more that you are able to emotionally connect with those donors, serve their interests and learn about them, the more successful you're going to be retaining those donors. And that's going to save you significant amounts of money. I used to analyze files, major gift files. And the attrition that I saw was terrible. I saw organizations around the $1 to $3 million mark that were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars from donor attrition. And I saw organizations that were you know, $10 million and up that were literally losing millions of dollars from donor attrition. So this is a really good cure for donor attrition. But you've got to do it right. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And then the final reason to do a donor survey is it helps you better target your appeals. You're going to learn specific information about what your donors care about most and that's going to help you better segment and target your appeals. So I'm going to show you a really great example and that, that shows all of these things. And um, so front and center in this example is it says right away, tell us what you think. It's really clear that they're asking for your opinion and that they want to hear from you. And you can see from the style of this survey example, it's, it's, it's very um, image driven, you know, kind of like a BuzzFeed quiz where the focus is really on the images. It's very clean, it's very easy to read, and um, so it's telling people right up front, hey, we want to hear from you, you're important to us, we can't do this without you. So we've created a brief five question survey to tell us what you think. Will you help us? Really simple, really clean. This is a literacy organization and, um, and, and serving kids, literacy for, for ch children is one of their primary programs. So these, this image really fits in with the mission of the organization as well. It isn't just clean and adorable. It completely fits in with the mission of their organization. So that's the first page, like introducing folks to the survey. Second, the very first question that they ask folks is, 
is the amount of communication that you're getting from us too much, just right, or you want more? So this is one of the most primary things that we can ask our donors, one of the very first questions. Now, you can ask this of your whole database. You, this is a great question for any major gift officers who are on the call today. This is, a, this is one of the primary things to be asking the donors that you have in your portfolio is how do you want to hear from me? And so for a mass survey to your, to, to your list, asking them questions mm -hmm. about just, just the amount mm -hmm. of communications that you're giving to them and what their satisfaction levels are with it is, is a really critical, fundamental primary question that you want to ask. The second question in this survey, and this is a really significant one, and this is, I think this is just such a, a brilliant survey. They, they are in this, in this simple five question survey, they are asking a lot of really fundamental questions about who they are and what they do and what the donor cares about. So the qu second question is, when it comes to literacy, again, this is a literacy organization, I'm most interested in helping all kids, adults, or families. So naturally, this organization is doing all three. They're helping just kids, they're helping just adults, and they're helping families. And of course, by asking this question, they're going to be able to specifically target their appeals to what the donor cares about the most, whether it's kids or adults or whether it's families. Now, in their third question, um, they're asking folks, this is another really brilliant way to ask this question. They're asking folks, your primary reason what was your primary reason for getting involved with us? Was it because you just wanted to learn more about literacy programs? So I just wanted to learn more. Was it an advocacy inspiration? Do you want to raise awareness about this issue? Is it an advocacy call? Or was it that you wanted to give? You wanted to donate money to ensure literacy? So this is a really important question. Like We're asking you, what brought you in the door? What was the thing that, that brought you into the door of the organization? And that says a lot about what kind of appeals these folks are going to respond to, mm -hmm. who should follow up with them, and how. And then the, the very last question that they asked in this survey was, um, what do they want their gifts to fund? Is it books? Is it teachers or is it youth mentors? This is critical, right? So by, ans by asking this question, they're going to be able to really successfully target appeals based on what these people want to, want to fund the most. And this is a really significant. So, you know, whether you are, um, you know, a literacy organization or it's animals or conservation or wildlife, within the genre of what the important work that you're doing, there are different programs that you have. And this is a great way that you can ask people which of those they care about the most. And then you can target these appropriately. So based on the answers from this survey, you can use the right appeal, you can use the right program, you can use the right images. So this is a really super excited to show this organization off um, and, and share the results of this survey. So now I want to talk with you about what I don't want you to ever ask in a donor survey. The first thing is when they gave. Don't, the bottom line is anything that's in your database, you don't need to ask them. You don't need to ask them when they gave. You don't need to ask them how much they gave. Chances are your donor isn't going to remember, and you already have this information in your database. You don't need to ask them this. You don't want to make your donor work. This, this can be an emotionally evocative survey that brings your donors closer to you, that makes them feel good about supporting you, that gives you really valuable information. This isn't a homework assignment. You're not giving them homework. You're not giving them work to do. Um, and you don't want to ask them anything that you already know. I was once on a webinar, and um, and the woman suggested that people ask their donors uh, what was their last last gift. And I just I was floored. D don't ask that because you know that information. It, it, it's insignificant and, uh, and and not worth asking in a donor survey. So don't ever ask them something that you already know that makes them work. So I have. A, uh, a truth bomb for everybody on why donor surveys matter so much and why they're so important. And I'm going to explain this to you using a pyramid. So you've probably seen at a conferences that you've gone to, you see this, this pyramid of donors. And this is, this is kind of fundamental language in our sector to talk about the work that we do and talk about the, um, 
the donors that we have in our file. And I think so many times we see this pyramid so much, we tend to think that our files look like this as well. But we've got people giving down at the bottom, and then we've got some people that are moving up the donor pipeline and making some mid-level gifts, and then we've got our most generous donors up at the top doing major gifts. And I think sometimes we see this so much we can think, oh, well, yeah, this is what a, a file looks like, and this must be what, what my file looks like, too. Well, the truth bomb is it doesn't really look like this healthy pyramid. In real life, um, it looks something much more like what you're seeing right now, which is um, like a sombrero. The reality of our files is that for, for most organizations, We've got a lot of people giving at the very bottom of our file, and we've got a few people giving at the top of our file. And the truth bomb here, and the reason why donor surveys are so important, is those donor surveys give you an opportunity to build that pipeline for major gift fundraising. When you find out what your donors care about, and you're able, and you and you ask them. I mean, just asking them what do you care about is a really significant step but when you ask them and you tailor your communications to them and you and you tailor your appeals to them you're helping grow that pipeline and move general fund donors up to mid-level donors and ultimately up to major gift donors so this is another reason why donor surveys are so important. They give you critical insights into your file, and they help you really build your pipeline for tomorrow of major gift donors. So I promised you guys um, a really great example that I learned from um, Adrian Sargent. Adrian Sargent literally wrote the book on building donor loyalty. I'm a huge fan of Adrian Sargent, and I, and I recommend that book. It's by Adrian Sargent and Jen Shang. And it's called Building Donor Loyalty, and it talks a lot about um, retention and, um, and, and ways to build donor loyalty. So if you haven't read it, I encourage you to check it out. But this is a really great example that, um, that, that he shared. Um, he did a presentation at AFP um, this year, AFP um, International. And he shared, he, he talked about the importance of, of surveying your donors and really what was new in building donor loyalty. And this was a great idea. He, he talked about... You know, just asking your donors what they think, asking your donors their opinion. And one way of doing that was by sharing with your donors, hey, you know what, we're thinking about doing a planned giving appeal. We've got a few different examples, and we'd love to ask your opinion on which of these you like the most. So I've got two examples. I don't have four. I'm not that creative, but I have two. These are actually fantastic examples um, from Dr. Russell James, who wrote Inside the Mind of the Bequest Donor. So this is an example of a planned giving appeal. This is a, a visualized autobiography. Um, school janitor Rufus Wells died in 1991. After school today, he'll help an eight-year-old understand math. So this is, you know, he's, he's passed away, but his gifts are making a difference. In the next version of this planned gift appeal, this is a different take. He's still alive. He signed his will today. One day, his bequest will help an eight-year-old understand math. Okay, so the point of this webinar is not planned giving appeals, but what an ingenious way to ask your donors their thoughts and opinions and get two planned gift appeals right in front of them. I think this is really fantastic. This is one of those I wish I thought of that. Um, if you're hungry for any more I wish I thought of that ideas, a great website for inspiration is Sophie, S-O-F-I-I dot -I org. There's lots of great examples of appeals um, on that website. So, um, so I want to tell you a couple things that I have coming up if you're interested in learning more uh, I've actually, I'm actually doing a webinar series coming up on getting your board uh, on board with you and, and board leadership and how to get your board fundraising. Uh, I've got lots of goodies in it, a free board contract, lots of guides. I also do classes. I do classes all over the country. Uh, if you want to switch to the next slide, John. I've got some classes coming up uh, in the next couple months. I've got one in D.C. and one in Dallas. If you're interested in spending a day really supercharging your fundraising and learning more to nail the ask, be a great storyteller, retain your donors, steward your donors, and build a fantastic major gift portfolio. I'd love to have you come to class. I think we are going to open it up for questions.
Rachel, that was brilliant. I love it. That was brilliant. Now, we do have a, a number of questions here. Um, Tara is asking, what systems are you using to tie the donor survey responses to the donor file, the, the donor CRM? Gosh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I work with organizations, and in my, in my own life, I've had so many different CRMs. Um, back in my day running Girl Start, we had eTapestry, Razor's Edge, uh, Convio, we had Salesforce. Uh, and so, you know, and I work with organizations that have some sprinkling of those and many more. So, you know, it really just depends on, um, on what, you're, what you're using and how you categorize. I, I coach gift officers. When I do my classes, I actually um, coach fundraisers to, with just using an Excel spreadsheet, because everyone has Excel, but everyone ha is likely to have a different database. And to document what the, and I'm talking about major donors, the major donors in their portfolio to document what their interests are. So depending on the, the system that you're using, you should have some interest codes in there that you can put in, or you might just only be able, you might be able to add it as a field in their um, biographical tab. It really just depends on the CRM that you're using. But, you know, I think some of this is, you, know, you could be an animal care organization, and it could be like dogs and cats. It could be a conservation organization, and it's different, th different, different programs that you're working on to it within the realm of conservation. So, I think that it's it's really up to up to how you want to structure it the best way in your CRM. Definitely for any major gift officers who on the call who are managing a portfolio, you need to have a really clear all of the. Um, interest that your donors have in your portfolio so that you're consistently speaking to them. And for everybody else, of course, it's really important that you're targeting your appeals based on your donor's interest. Got it. Okay. Now, Charlotte, Charlotte is uh, just made a comment um, waiting to see John Hayden's screen. Um, Charlotte, I guess you're using the iPad, the GoToWebinar iPad app, and I seems like there might be an error with that, but everyone else and I can see, well, obviously I can see my own screen, but um, it is, other people are making comments uh, such that they can see the screen, they're asking questions, so I think it's, it could be just an iPad issue, um, so sorry about that. I'm going to move on to Gail. Uh, Gail's asking, how did the organization send the bequest ad choices to donors? Was it print or email? And I believe Gail is talking about these two examples that I'm showing on the screen. I totally um, made this up from reading Russell James's book. This isn't, um, I, I didn't use this appeal. I think it's genius, and I like recreated it from reading his book. It's a great book. I, I totally recommend it. I, I find plan, plan giving just fascinating because it's such a different animal. Uh, fundraising, you know, you think about, you send out a normal fundraising appeal, and it's like, oh, yay, I want to give. You send out a plan giving appeal, and it's like, Oh my God! I'm gonna die one day. It's it's a yeah. very different kind of fundraising. Um, so that's a great book that I recommend. But there are so many different ways that you can um, market plan giving: uh, postcards mm. in your newsletter, on your website. Um, PlanGiving.guru mm -hmm. is a great site yeah. to get some inspiration around plan giving. Mm. Um, I, I talk about it a lot in my trainings because I, I, I really feel like, and this is from my own background as a fundraiser, I started Girl Start when I was 26 years old and I ran Girl Start for 12 years. And obviously um, starting an organization at that young of an age, wills and bequests weren't at the top of my mind. Plan giving wasn't at the top of yeah. my mind. I didn't have a lot of people who reached out to me about plan gifts. But so I feel like I'm kind of making up for it later in life. It's a fascinating kind of fundraising, and there are uh, a lot of opportunities. I think the thing with plan giving is people feel like I felt, where there people, a lot of fundraisers, you don't feel like you're you're not a tax attorney, you're not an accountant, and you can feel like, well, I don't understand all these nuances between um, a charitable gift annuity, and it's just too complicated. But most Plan gifts are wills, and wills are quite simple. And really, plan giving for us as fundraisers is really about 
asking the right questions and making our donors aware of the opportunities. So I really like to demystify plan giving and help people understand that it's really just about having a introducing it as a conversation with a donor and making sure that people know that opportunity is front and center. You don't have to be an accountant or a tax attorney to talk to your donors about plan giving. You know, uh, uh, of these two examples, um, this this one in my mind is how people think about plan giving. It's kind of the common thinking about it. Like, okay, he signed his will and eventually he's going to help out um, some, you know, an eight-year-old understand math. This 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 um, puts a spin on it. So he died in 1991, but after school, he's going to help an eight-year-old understand math. So it's putting this new, yeah. uh, kind of a different spin on it that makes you look twice. Wait, wait, he died in 19, but he's still around. Yeah. Oh, I get it. That's it's the a, whole, it's yeah. like a novelty, which you can't, you, you have to pay attention because you're trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's brilliant. I love it. It, it um, There's like an element of cognitive dissonance. Wait, he's dead, but he's teaching a kid how to, what? You know, so then the, it, it's, it seems, uh, it's interesting. It's very creative. I like it. Good job. Um, uh, I great plan giving example recently, plan, plan giving of ask, and it was elephants, and it was the backs of elephants, it was like elephant butts, and the headline said, will you leave something behind? And it was like, th that's, you know, this isn't setting off my grim reaper, like bells and whistles, you know, yeah. this is, you know, this is funny, this is reverent, that's perfect for a wildlife uh, you know, or an animal organization. So there's so there's lots of. I don't think plan giving doesn't have to be this stuffy, complicated element. And I think that's what keeps people from doing it. But the truth yeah. is, it's it's really about making people aware of the opportunity and asking them questions. And yeah. Inviting them to so, so so don't use the Grim Reaper in like a plan giving campaign, right? <laughs> no. My not. colleague actually uh, told me about uh, a long time ago, he got invited to, um, an organization invited them to view their new plan giving spot, and they were really excited about it, and it literally was an ambulance arriving at someone's house, awesome. and he thought it was a joke, it was like, the, that was a commercial spot. Oh my god, you will die someday, are you ready, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> It's going to be horrible, horribly painful. There's going to be lots of blood. <laughs> Are you prepared? No. Um, so, uh, and then Grant is asking um, two questions. Uh, what was the survey for? And I believe you did, you, there was a, you skipped survey, the question four, I think, if we go question one, question two, question yeah. four, and then five. I think maybe you kept that out. I did. I did. Question four was a fascinating question that uh, was related to, um, the organization's brand, but I couldn't include question four because I, um, I, I, I'm not sharing the name of the organization that did this survey, mm -hmm. and if I did share four, I would reveal it, but That's it was true. a very fascinating question that, um, that really spoke directly to their brand. Yeah. So, um, so that was pretty much, it was, it was really um, those five questions, and th th they were sent to people on the list, so as soon as they answered question five, it was submitted, and this organization, um, they had a, let's see, they had a pretty good open rate. They had a 12% open rate. I would tell folks on the call today, you know, if you if you asked me like what things would help me get, you know, really help with my open rate, a really great subject line is going to help you a lot. Um, using Im these, this is a very image rich survey, which is great. This is this obviously feels a lot more fun to answer than filling out like a survey monkey survey. And then the last point was, I love the comments that you made in your newsletter, um, John, that you sent out yesterday. And John talked in his newsletter about when to send, when to ask survey questions. And those were genius. Do you want to share what you what you mentioned, John? Yeah, I, the whole point, um, and it was in the email newsletter that went out yesterday, but basically the whole point, and this applies to really any, most email communications, is on our timeline, you know, we send out the email blast, or let's say we're going to survey our donors, we send out this massive email that goes out to thousands of donors, but it's uh, the problem with that, the fundamental problem is that it's on the nonprofit's timeline, not on the donor's timeline, right, and you may catch them at a bad time, chances are you will, but if you time it, um, 
to survey donors right after they do something, like right after they make a donation, right after they attend an event, right after they volunteer for your organization, that is, you're much more likely to get someone to actually complete the survey simply because you're, they've recently had an interaction with you and you're kind of fresh on their mind. Yeah, that's a great tip. I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic one. I mean, you know, you can also, um, another great tip that I learned is really like engineering a lot of this around drop-off points when you start seeing people, um, you know, not responding on your file and, you know, letting your donors know how their gift made an impact. When you know the answer to these questions, you can do the best possible job letting them know how their gift made an impact. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so let's see. Uh, we got a cu just a couple more questions. I know I see more. Uh, let's see. But there was one question again from Gail. Um, if you can't afford a sophisticated, well-branded survey like the literacy example, what communication medium for surveys get the highest response rate? Um, and if I could just throw in two, like a quick comment. Um, the most important thing about a survey is. Um, how you're presenting it and how it looks. So it's not necessarily the tool, but in this example, for example, the images, and I love how, you know, even the answers have an image. So it's super easy. It's very quick to fill out. People get it right away, and, that, and that's, I'm sure, contributed to the, its success. Um, but there are tools that are very affordable. Um, I usually recommend either Survey, Survey Gizmo or Survey Monkey. And what I love about those tools is that they integrate very easily with other third-party uh, CRMs. That's awesome. Yeah, you could do a survey like this for you know like fifteen hundred dollars. This doesn't have to 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 break the bank if you were going to go out and do a lot of you know a design on something like this. Exactly. But those are yeah. great suggestions. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. And I think. Oh, um, Trina is asking a brilliant question. I think we're going to end with this one just because of time. Uh, Trina says, how do you feel about written surveys as opposed to online surveys, meaning paper surveys that are sent in the mail as opposed to online surveys? I love this. And this, this totally tees up what you the next webinar that John and I are planning on doing. This is a great question. Um, so I think written surveys definitely have their place. And... Um, um, and, and they actually have a really, can you still hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Yes. okay. Yep. Um, uh, I think, okay, so written surveys are really fantastic and what I like to coach people to do with written surveys is really use them in managing your top donors, like your major gift portfolio or mid-level portfolio, and use written surveys as a pre-call letter, like send them a letter and let them know, well, the first, the first thing in the letter is just thank you. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for being a part of our family here at our organization. I want to let you know how your gifts are making a difference. I want to call on you or visit with you so that I can let you know just, a, just more detail on the impact and the lives that you're changing. And so I'm a big fan of doing um, of doing that. I mean, it's definitely you know this is these online surveys are something you can do for the masses in your constituent base. But if you were trying to determine um, who are the best prospects in in your major gift portfolio, doing um, p printed surveys with uh, like a pre-call letter are definitely a, a a very good option for you to pursue. Another great option is. Um, is, is using video for that as well. Video is, of course, more expensive than paper, but it's a vi it can be extremely efficient in terms of identifying who among the donors in your file really want to have mm -hmm. a deeper relationship with you and letting them self-select so that you can efficiently follow up with them. Rachel, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, so everybody, uh, you, you should be able to download these slides. Um, the recording will be published and in, included in next week's newsletter, so a link to the recording. Uh, and I just want to say again, Rachel, thank you so much. This is incredibly valuable. I learned a lot. Uh, lots of really great uh, questions here, discussion. People seem to love it, according to the questions here. Um, and that's it. Did you, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun.
Okay, great. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, everybody else, and we'll all talk very soon.